In this video, I'm excited to share a special conversation I had at GTC with the CTO of Agility Robotics. We dive into the incredible technology behind Digit, their humanoid robot that they created specifically to work in warehouse situations around human environments. And why is that important for this channel? Because we're always diving into 3D reconstruction and creating real worlds in 3D. And that's the exact type of data you need to train a humanoid robot like Digit. So in this conversation, we dive into the design choices of why they made a humanoid robot, what goes into training a robot to work in a complex human world, and we even dive into generative AI, which they're using to accelerate the learning curve for perception models that allows this robot to interact with the world. Well, enough talking, and let's get to this conversation. Hello, everyone. I'm here today with Pras Velikaputi from Agility Robotics. He's the chief technology officer, and we're going to learn all about this robot that you might see walking behind us in this video. Pras, nice to meet you. I'm Jonathan, and I have some, I have some questions because there's been a lot of buzz. We're at GTC, and I have not seen this sort of crowd at one booth before. And I think it's just because it's a humanoid robot. We see the future. So my first question is then, why did you go with the humanoid form at Agility Robotics? Yeah, so at Agility, what we really wanted to create was a robot that could go out and operate in human environments. And so it's less that it's humanoid than human-centric. It's designed to operate in the same spaces as people do. And that leads to some aspects that are kind of similar to how a human operates, and some that aren't quite as similar, as you can see. Mm -hmm. uh, but as we designed the robot, we really started with this physics first idea of what do we need to do to locomote around the places where people go and manipulate the things that people interact with in the workspaces that we build for ourselves. So that means being able to reach a really wide workspace, being able to go down low and up high without taking up a lot of footprint. When you put all of those things together, uh, what you find is that a really effective way to do all of that and still have the type of mobility and uh, flexibility that you want is with something that ends up with two legs, two arms, and what looks like a head, although all of those pieces don't quite work the way that the human analogs do. Okay, so another unique thing about this robot, I feel like, is the legs. I can see it in the corner of my eye. It looks like almost like a, I don't know, grasshopper leg or... It's kind of like a bird leg. You sometimes use bird leg. an avian kind of leg as a descriptor. So why choose, why did you go with that versus like a human leg? Yeah, so it really comes from how the robot itself evolved in our designs. Uh, when Jonathan first started the company, uh, part of the physics first design of the robot was basically trying to capture... Um, the dynamics of walking. So what are the forces that are involved and how are they applied to the world? And it turned out that a really good way to replicate that was with a leg structure that basically coupled leg hitch and leg extension into separate axes. And we could do that with that Conrad transmission that we see back there. So that was a simplification that let us focus on getting the physics right. Now, as we've evolved, we've actually improved our actuators and improved our controls through things like AI uh, to the point where, well, it's actually not as important that we have this specific configuration, but it's what let us get to this point. And of course, it has some conveniences like being able to get really close to objects without you hitting them with your knee. Uh, but a lot of the original reasons we did them in order to simplify the dynamics, we've actually uh, kind of built up the infrastructure to be less reliant on. Okay. So you have that, you have the big benefit, you're going with the humanoid form, so you don't have to make a new warehouse for a specific type of robot, but since it's humanoid, you don't have to exactly follow a human's body structure. That's you right. can use all these other advantages, but still make it work with yeah. arms, legs. Can I, can I move in the same aisles that a human would be able to move in and not have to make them super wide or make the floors yes. super flat or things like that? But then it doesn't really matter exactly what my leg looks like as long as I can get around in that space. Yeah. So then moving beyond just the robotics itself and into our company is really into sensing the world, taking photos, re understanding. Can you describe that like infinite problem that robots run into of sensing an environment and all the edge cases it has to learn? Can you just give us a little bit of a glimpse of how you guys approach that problem and can you just explain that problem in general? Yeah, so perception is always a very challenging problem. Being able to sense and interpret both the world around you 
and also the proprioception inside of you of what your robot's own state is. Uh, that's something that we address with a variety of different sensors. So you can see that Digit has a number of cameras and a LiDAR unit uh, up in its head assembly and also in its pelvis uh, to be able to look around it and see both um, color and depth information around uh, its environment. Okay. It also has a number of sensors that are internal facing, things like joint encoders uh, and being able to sense things like forces and currents and uh, an IMU to help it balance to tell it what its own state is with respect to the world. So you take all of those pieces and fuse them together to get a world state that you're using to make decisions about what you're trying to do. Now, in this particular demo, we're actually using AI to help us uh, take some of that world state and turn it into task information. In this case, semantically figuring out where in the world we're gonna find our groceries uh, and be able to put them in the basket. Um, so that's where we take some of that fused data or calibrated data and put it through uh, a semantic uh, vision model to be able to turn it into things like masks that identify really useful regions of the environment for us to do things like grasping or other types of skills. Okay, so then when I'm looking at this robot and I'm thinking you have eventually, or you, at the start you had to train it somewhere where you're using uh, NVIDIA's Isaac Sim, where you're using you know, some sort of simulated area before you put it in production somewhere or in a listen, test environment? Yeah, so great question. It depends on exactly which part of the system we're looking at. So in this case, the perception was using a pre-trained model. We could use a web scale model and basically adapt it to our application. as so that gets us a lot of richness and diversity. In fact, the objects that we're using here, we literally picked them up at a grocery store in San Jose. They didn't ship them, but Digit had never seen these objects before. Wow. We just okay. picked them out. And that's the type of generality that you can get with web scale models in pieces like perception. On the control side though, Digit's got its very unique dynamics. And so that we actually trained in Isaac Lab. Okay. And so all of the whole body control that Digit is doing here uh, is actually motions that we trained in Isaac Lab um, towards you know, being able to show off a full uh, learn stack for this GTC demo. Okay, what I think is interesting is, I've been watching it all day, is that you pick water bottles, you pick this basket that's got swing mm -hmm. arms, so the physics isn't rigid, big object that's not gonna tilt and move, and I thought that was a great, a great idea. Yeah, we've been moving around stuff on the shelf, you know, it's, I think one of the real strengths of using these AI-based policies is they're just very resilient. Um, they might look a little bit, you know, unintuitive, like the robot like has figured out its own way to achieve things like power efficiency and stability. And one of the things that we actually didn't expect, but we're finding, is that the policy that we trained for um, GTC here is actually running slightly more energy efficiently than the normal policy that we have. Uh, and we didn't actually plan that out. It just sort of emerged during the training at some point. Uh, and so we've actually been able to run longer than anticipated oh, between batteries, uh, between swapping robots out to charge. All right. Okay, so then I've been doing a lot of diving into Cosmos, which is we've heard at the keynote at GTC, there's got to be more to the models that were initially released. And I heard that you guys are also starting to develop with that or test with that. Can you talk about just generally how you envision using Cosmos to accelerate the training of these robots? Yeah, so Cosmos offers us an opportunity to generate data for data-driven parts of the modeling uh, beyond what we can collect in the real world. So if you're looking at something like learning how you might want to manipulate an object, um, there's reinforcement learning that you can do to figure out, you know, just completely blindly, how might I just permute the different ways I could grab this object. But sometimes you're trying to replicate some semantically meaningful way of dealing with an object, like mm -hmm. pushing the buttons on a microwave or something like that. Now, imagine that you're trying to train a skill that's able to push the buttons on a microwave, and you want to create a diverse data set of all of the possible microwaves under all of the different lighting conditions you might encounter or something like that. Um, rather than trying to collect all of that data, you can take some example data and basically synthetically augment it, try re-rendering it at different states, or in Cosmos's world state evolution, maybe even try and render out 
eventualities that never happened in real yes. life and see uh, how to build that into your data set when you're training this uh, skill layer that, that can be deployed in the real world. So it lets you really kind of augment what data you could get out of the real world uh, with synthetic versions of that um, that are really like virtual hypotheticals uh, that you may not really have the time or the bandwidth or the capability, especially in cases like testing out non-nominal behavior uh, to capture the real world. Yeah, that's something that we've seen is it's a great way if you have a small edge case and you need a lot of you know, synthetic data or real, almost real data to quickly just reinforce some little aspect and you're, you don't have to spend all this time recreating that in real world. It's just, we already have a lot of similar imagery. Let's augment that. Yeah, and I think the real interesting part of the Cosmos ecosystem is the idea of not just thinking about it in terms of imagery, but really thinking about it in terms of world state. Mm -hmm. um, some of the stuff that they've been demonstrating around basically rendering out world state evolutions, like what could happen in a video sequence based on uh, what the world model itself might determine, right? This is how something is gonna move. This is how two objects are gonna interact. Makes it particularly powerful if we're able to do some of those things. Okay, so last question. Uh, I sometimes talk to aspiring roboticists in, in universities. Uh, is there anything in the next like, five years you feel like they should be really focused on as they're you know, studying in the university that will help them when they eventually work at a company like Agility Robotics, like give them a leg up. <laughs> yeah, I definitely think uh, it's it's challenging right now, but keeping abreast of all of these developments in AI, in some sense, it's kind of leveled the playing field because everybody has so many new things to learn. Like I'm learning new techniques and technologies all of the time, uh, even today. And being able to work with the latest techniques and understand how they um, might be applied in situations like these onto robots like Digit is really kind of an important skill set that everyone's looking for right now. Yes. All right. Well, that's very really helpful. Well, thank you for your time. And I hope I get to go visit you guys in person. I hear you're in Salem, Oregon. Yeah, you. definitely.